Welcome, everyone. Today we have the pleasure to have uh, Patrick Noon with us. He's going to be talking about fundamentals of property ownership, business entity. So, Patrick, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, go ahead and please uh, briefly introduce yourself, and the floor is yours. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, well, Patrick gets set up. I want to show you the different entity comparisons chart. Okay, um, Patrick is going to go over each one of them in more detail and summarize. Okay, friends, well, Patrick gets uh, set up. We're going to get started. So let's start with the basics, okay? Reasons why you need an entity. There are primarily three reasons why you need to have an entity when you're going to be in real estate. Uh, so reason number one is for asset protection, okay? So what that means is that when you buy a property, if something wants to happen, your personal assets are protected. So when you buy a property under an entity, let's say ABZ Inc., uh, somebody sues you, guess what? They won't be able to get to your personal assets because your liability is going to be contained within that particular entity, okay? Obviously, uh, when it comes to asset protection, you always need to have an umbrella policy. Uh, so if there was a big disaster like the collapse of the porches in Chicago about 10 years ago where people got seriously injured, guess what? Uh, the owner had that particular building under an entity. So he ended up losing that building, but not the rest of his properties, okay? Um, and not only that, but the umbrella policy kicked in. So when the liability exceeds your insurance policy, then the umbrella policy kicks in, okay? Um, so that's one of the biggest benefits of having an entity. Uh, the second reason, it's going to be for funding. So believe it or not, you may wonder, well, why does that make a, a difference, right? Whether I bore under my personal name or I bore under my entity, big difference. Okay, and the reason why is because in Illinois, the foreclosure process takes about two years. So what does that mean? If, let's assume, you take a loan on, under your name, and for whatever reason you default on the mortgage payments, the bank is going to file a lawsuit against you, okay? They're going to take you through the court system 
in the foreclosure process that can take up to you up to two years however if that process is under your entity they can foreclose in as little as six months okay patrick i see you are uh, online can you hear us okay i can hear you can you hear me we hear you right awesome <laughs> thank you Sorry, for joining I don't know what's patrick. Going on with the internet over here today but it's not working too good um do you want me to start from the beginning of my presentation absolutely okay well good evening everyone thank you for joining me uh, i have to call a client in los angeles at about 7 15 uh, but i think i'll be done before then and hopefully have time to answer any questions um, what you can see on your screen comes from one of our tax resource manuals it's called the entity comparison chart and what it is it's a side-by-side -side comparison of all the different business entities that the IRS recognizes. And I'm going to just spend a little bit of time, you know, maybe a minutes or so on each one, and just kind of go over the highlights with you. And, um, and then at the end, like I say, if there's any questions, you know, feel free to ask. So the first one to the far left is a sole proprietorship. That is the easiest and quickest entity to create. There's no um, articles of incorporation needed for the Secretary of State. Um, or any kind of a written agreement. Uh, basically, when you're a sole proprietor, you're working out. If there's more than one person, you can't be a sole proprietorship. You'd have to default to one of the other entities to the right. But um, with a sole proprietor, you file Schedule C as part of your personal return, your personal return being a 1040. Um, and it is one of, like I say, one of the easiest ways to get into business. Uh, the, the huge drawback is that you are not incorporated, which means that if, God forbid, somebody were to slip and fall on one of your properties, or, you know, if somebody were to put a nail through their foot, you know, with a nail gun on, on a fix and flip, you have unlimited liability, which means that if they go to court and they sue you, and there's a judgment entered against you and you don't have enough insurance to cover the the judgment they'll go after your business assets and if it's still not satisfied then they'll go after your personal assets which could be your home your savings account um, investments a second home so although it's one of the quickest and easiest entities to get up and running there's a lot of negatives to it and at the bottom on page two of this chart, there's a, uh, a good, bad, and ugly of each entity. Um, so I would take a look at that and see, you know, and see if the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. If they do, well, then great. You know, you can set up a sole proprietorship. It's the least expensive. You can get it going in an hour if you needed to. Okay. But again, um, not only is there uh, unlimited liability, but when you are a sole proprietor, you have to pay what's called self tax, which is in addition to your income tax. When you're an employee and you're working for a big corporation like General Motors or IBM or Microsoft, you'll pay half of the social security tax and your employer will pay the other half. But when you're a sole proprietor, you have to pay both sides, both ends of it. And both ends come to 15.3%. So you have 15.3% self-employment tax. Minimum tax bracket is 10%. So now you're up to 25. And then after that, there's another 5% to the state of Illinois. So when you're a sole proprietor, 30% of your net income, which is gross income minus expenses, 30% of your net income you will pay to both the IRS and the state of Illinois. Um, there's other ways, there's other entities that I'll talk about in a little bit where you can avoid that. So um, the next entity over is a partnership. And and obviously with a partnership, you have to have more than one person. You can't you can't have just the one one person when you're in a partnership of two or more people. Okay. Um, 
There's different types of partnerships. There's what they call general partnerships, where if Hugo and I were in partnership together, we were both general partners, I would be responsible for his actions and he would be responsible for my actions, which, you know, if, if it's a shaky relationship, you probably wouldn't want to do that. Um, you can create what's called a limited partnership. And the limited partner is only liable to the extent of the money that he's invested for the partnership interest. So it's not unlimited, it's not general. Instead, it's a limited partnership and you're on the hook for whatever your investment is. Um, partnerships file a separate tax return known as uh, IRS Form 1065. That's the partnership form number. And what happens is the partnership itself doesn't pay income taxes to the to the IRS. There is a little tax paid to the state of Illinois, of course, because we're both. But there's no taxes paid to the IRS. Instead, what happens is each partner receives K-1 form. It's called Schedule K-1, and it represents that partner's share or percentage of the profits or loss of the partnership for that year. You don't necessarily have to receive the money, okay, but you do have to report the income. Some people refer to that as phantom income. So if, let's say the partnership makes $10,000 net income, you're a 50 cent partner, you have to pick up $5,000 of partnership income on your personal return. It's reported on page two of Schedule E, okay? But you may, I've had partners come to me and say, but I didn't get any money. Why do I have to, why do I have to pick this up? I never got anything. Well, you didn't get anything because the money was retained or kept in the business for, you know, either future expansion or for operating expenses, things like that. And because of that, you may not, you know, actually receive any partnership distribution, but yet, um, because you are a partner in the partnership, you do have to pick up the K-1. And if you don't, the IRS has this matching program going on whereby <clears throat> once they get through tax season, they'll do, they'll do a matching of what the taxpayer reported versus what they have on their end. And if it doesn't match up, you'll get a love letter in the mail from them saying, hey, we've got you know, more income. I just had a client today where the, the girl worked somewhere and for whatever reason uh, i think she worked as a waitress and for whatever reason she didn't give me the w-2 for 2019. now typically those forms are mailed out so who knows if the post office never delivered it but she got a love letter from the irs today saying hey here's what you show we show the difference you know let us know if we're right or wrong well obviously they're right because it was w-2 and she did work for that employer. She just neglected to put it on her return. So they do have this thing called the matching program. Okay, the next one over, the third one, is a C corporation. C corporations are like big corporations. And they could be small too, but typically like IBM, General Motors, or you know Amazon, somebody big like that, where you are a shareholder in the corporation. But you're not actually involved in the day-to-day -day operations or the setting policies and procedures for the corporation. A C corporation files IRS Form 1120, okay, and that entity does pay their own income taxes, okay. And when Trump came in, the, the corporate income tax rate was set at 20% for C corporations, which was really a big break because prior to that, the it was a graduated income tax, whereby it kept jumping up depending upon what bracket you were in. But when Trump came in, he said, let's just make it a flat 20%. I think now it's up to 21%. And who knows if Biden's gonna change it. Every president seems to put their own mark on the tax code, which <laughs> probably drives the IRS crazy because they have to recalibrate all their computers rather than tax rates and whatnot. Um, 
a C corporation, like I said, they file 1120, they pay their own income taxes, both federal and state. And the, the nice thing about a C corporation, though, is if you are a shareholder in a C corporation, typically your liability is limited to the amount of your invest or this what you paid for the for the stock or the shares. Okay, there's no unlimited liability. Um, they do have to be created by submitting articles of incorporation with the uh, Illinois Secretary of State. I think there's a filing fee of around $125 or so to set up a C corporation with the Secretary of State. And then once you get back from the Secretary of State, your bylaws, in other words, you know, being on the records or on the tax rolls of the state, then at that time you would apply for a tax ID number, okay, and you would also register um, with the Illinois Department of Revenue as well for, for income taxes for them. Um, that's pretty much how a C corporation works. It's a separate standalone entity and has no impact on your personal return, but because you are incorporated, you do have limited liability. So if, if somebody, you know, were to sue you, you know, for slipping and falling or getting hurt doing a six and slip, you would, your liability would be limited um, by the corporate status. The fourth one over is an S corporation, and everybody loves an S corporation. I have two companies myself, one for preparing taxes and another one for getting the IRS off of people SS, which is our trademark uh, slogan, and they are both S corporations. And S corporate, they call it an S corporation because it comes from subchapter S of the Internal Revenue Code. And what the way it works is works very similar to a C corporation, except the net income from the S corporation that gets again assigned via uh, Schedule One to the individual shareholders of the corporation. And there they would pick up their own um, their own share of the income or loss and report it on their personal return. The one huge benefit, and the IRS knows about this, so you got to be careful. But the one huge benefit of an S corporation is you do not have to pay self-employment tax like you would with a sole proprietor or guaranteed payment out of a partnership. A, an S corporation is not, and for whatever reason, it's written in the code, is not, shareholders are not subject to self-employment tax. They only pay income tax. But there's a big but, and here's the but. However, the S frowns upon people, shareholders, who show big fat K-1s that they're only going to pay income tax on. They don't show any wages in out of the S corporation because any wages would be subject to um, social security tax made up of uh, FICA and, and Medicare. And so because of that, the IRS is on, you know, they look out for people who have S corporations, take these big, huge K-1s, they pay the tax on that, but they don't pay self-employment tax. So the IRS says you have to take what is considered to be a reasonable salary. Problem is nobody really knows what's reasonable um, and typically the IRS will use tests such such as would you pay somebody to do what you do if you couldn't do it or what would you expect to be paid by another company if you went to go work for them those are guidelines that the IRS will use in determining what is considered a reasonable salary it's not a fixed dollar amount it's not a certain percentage I will tell you that I have some clients that are very, very conservative, and they'll say, okay, half of the net income I'll take on a W-2, and the other half of the K, uh, income I'll put on a K-1. So let's say, for instance, you know, the net income after all deductions is $100,000. They'll take a $50,000 W-2, and then they'll take $50,000 on the K-1. That's really conservative, and I, I would be shocked if that would raise eyebrows at the IRS. Um, I do know of one account in Buffalo, New York, a friend of mine, and he'll do a four to one split on the net income. So, using that same example of a hundred thousand, what he'll do is he'll put 
20,000 of it to a W-2 and 80,000 of it on a K-1. To me, that's kind of pushing the envelope. And, and there's some clients that have agreed with me and said, no, 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 that, that's too aggressive. And instead of a 50-50 split, they'll do maybe a 60-40 or maybe a 70-30. But this 80-20 this split is, is a little bit too rich for their blood. So be careful when you're doing that. But you should report something in wages because if you don't, it, it's almost like a red flag to the IRS. Um, the last entity on the far right is an LLC, which is short for Limited Liability Company. Came into being a few years ago in the state of Illinois. And in LLC, there is no tax form, you know, reserved specifically for an LLC. So when, when I meet a new client and they say, well, I'm an LLC, I say, great, what kind of LLC are you? And they have no idea what type of LLC they are. Because the way it works is when you apply, when, when you get your article of incorporate, well, actually for LLC, of agreement. When you get the articles of agreement from the state of Illinois, Secretary of State, you then okay, and on there it'll be you know ABC Homes LLC. And if you don't designate what type of LLC it's going to be, the default in the tax code is that it's recognized very similar to a sole proprietor, meaning you file Schedule C, you pay income tax, you pay self-employment tax. Okay. However, when you get the tax ID, you can make the option to have the LLC taxed as either a sole proprietor, partnership, S corp, or C corp. They're all they're all on the table, and whichever one you want to go with, you make the election, and the IRS will recognize your LLC as that type of entity. So, like I say, there's no there's no single tax form for an LLC. Because depending upon what you elect or what you don't elect will determine what tax uh, status you have. Um, and if you elect to be taxed as an S corporation, then you'll follow the S corporation rules. And if you elect to be, you know, taxed as a partnership, you'll follow the partnership rules. And if you don't make any election at all, then you're going to be, you'll default to a sole proprietorship where you will have insulation from liability. But you'll still be paying probably 30 cents on the dollar as far as your net income goes. Um, if anybody uh, needs this entity comparison chart, uh, you can send me an email and, and I'm ready to shoot one out to you tomorrow. Um, my email address is noon CPA. So that's my last name is N double O N E CPA at gmail.com. And just, you know, in the, in the subject line, just put ECC. I'll know that that means anti-comparison chart, or just spelling the whole thing out. You just put ECC in there, and I'll shoot you um, this two-page entity comparison chart. And if you have any questions, we're not like attorneys. Hopefully there's no attorneys on this call. <laughs> we, don't, we don't charge for phone calls. You know, if you have a question or two, there's a lot of mastery students that I work with right now. Uh, a lot of Hugo's uh, students as well. And like I say, my office is in St. Charles. It's a western suburb for those of you who are not familiar with it. And it's tax season. Thank you, IRS, for extending it another month. Everyone's like, oh, I can relax. Now I got until May 17th. So I'm still there seven days a week and um, try to get out on half days on Saturdays and Sundays if I can. I'm allowed to go in on Sundays as long as I bring home lunch to the troops and the troops and my two German shepherds. <laughs> so um, try to reach me, you know, during the day if you can. Um, I try not to do too much business when I'm at home. Um, and if anybody has any questions, still got a few minutes before I got to jump on a call with L.A. And uh, that's about it. You there? Yeah, Patrick, there's a question. If you don't elect your LLC to be declared and you end up being a sole proprietor, 
and you have multiple members, what happens with the IRS? Well, again, you can't you can't be a sole proprietor if there's more than one person. So if you have multiple members, your options are either a partnership, a C corp, or an S corp, because a sole proprietorship, by definition, is only one taxpayer. Make sense? Thank you, Patrick. There's another question. Which one do you recommend for somebody with two properties? I would recommend, but they, they have this thing called a series LLC, and Hugo could probably speak more to this than myself, but what it is is you create a series LLC so you don't have to keep going back to the Secretary of State time and time and time again every time you get a new property. But what you want to do is create a series LLC and what that is, it basically it creates a firewall in between two properties. So if you have two properties, we'll call them property A and property B. If somebody slips and falls on property A and sues you, property B they cannot touch because it's in a series LLC and, and it's like a standalone entity. But the beauty of an LLC, series LLC is instead of paying somebody like me to file separate corporate income tax returns for each property, you can group properties together and only have to file one income tax return. Now you still need to keep separate checking accounts and, and use separate credit cards for each entity, you know, but at the end of the year we can combine all the rent income and all the advertising and all the repairs and maintenance and file just one overall encompassing return. Thank you, Patrick. Are there any other questions for Patrick? If not, Hugo, why don't you talk a little bit about what your preferred entity is? Okay, so <clears throat> let me dive into these. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off, everyone. Uh, so the reason, you have three main reasons to incorporate. One, asset protection, that's what uh, Patrick was covering. Number two, for funding. Uh, many lenders will lend under your entity because they can foreclose in as little, as little as six months versus your personal name. It can take up to two years because Illinois is a judicial stake and the foreclosure process needs to go through the court system and now takes at least two years. With the pandemic, obviously, more. And the third reason is for tax benefits and the biggest tax benefit is depreciation okay uh, this is going to help you write off a lot of expenses minimize your taxable income so this is huge um, so again these are the main three reasons why you want to incorporate now the question is which entity makes sense for your exit strategies okay so in real estate you can either wholesale, buy and hold, and fix and flip, okay? So which entity makes the most sense at this point? Okay, uh, let me, I thought you guys had the camera on. Okay, so again, so you have three main benefits, asset protection, funding, and tax benefit, tax depreciation. Now, you have to pick entity that makes the most sense. In my personal opinion, S Corp. S Corp is one of the best entities because it avoids double taxation um, from this C Corp. Okay, so that's one of the entities that you don't want to utilize. As Patrick mentioned, just large corporations, double taxation at the personal level and then at the corporate level. Um, now, if you are two or more, partners then you can do an LLC okay but if it's only yourself you can do an S Corp now you can use either an LLC or an S Corp for any of these exit strategies um, wholesaling buy and hold and flip now wholesaling is more flexible because you're not actually buying the property you're just reassigning the rights of the contract to an end buyer 
So this doesn't really matter if you're going to be wholesaling. You don't need to have an entity. What you do need to have is your broker's license, which is a bigger deal, right? So if you're going to do wholesaling, it could be under your personal name, only for one wholesale every 12 months. But other than that, um, here you do need to have a licensed broker if you're going to take on wholesaling as um, an exit strategy that is going to happen. You're going to do many wholesale deals. But if you're going to buy and hold or fix and flip, you are going to be okay with an LLC. Again, that's my, my recommendation is two or more partners do an LLC. Why? Because you are going to have your articles of, of incorporation plus you're going to have your bylaws. In the bylaws, it states who the members are, what their responsibilities, and what their benefits are. Okay? So it's super important to do an LLC in case you have two or more uh, partners. Now, S Corp, very simple, very straightforward. If it's only for yourself. Uh, now, the question is well, should I create an entity? for every property that I buy? And the answer is no. So the, the way this is done or should be done is based on equity, okay? So the rule of thumb is you create an entity, let's say your LLC in here, and you're gonna be buying properties under the same entity until you reach 500 thousand in equity okay at that point you're going to move some of the houses to llc2 okay then you're going to put another house here so the rule of thumb is driven by equity okay so you don't want to put a single property that has not much equity in one llc and the reason why is because you're going to add a lot of overhead every year you need to file a tax return for your entity not only that you're going to need to pay state fees okay so that could be very expensive uh, and unnecessary because again the main purpose is to have asset protection therefore if you have one entity that has let's say five thousand in equity it wouldn't make sense to create another another entity for another property that only has five thousand in dollars in equity because all you have to lose is five thousand per equity right should something go wrong um so again you're gonna pile them up into a single entity until you reach half a million in equity but again you must have an umbrella policy um that will kick in in the event that your um liability insurance for that particular entity it exceeds a lawsuit, for instance, for the damages. Um, so that pretty much summarizes what you need to know in a nutshell. Okay, just to simplify, um, two or more people, LLC, if you, it's only yourself, S Corp, we particularly have an S Corp for uh, our buy and holds. And whenever we do flips, then fix and flip. Now, something to keep in mind is if you're gonna do partnerships, right? What what makes sense? What type of agreement ma makes sense? Well, um, you want to partner up primarily on fix and flips, okay? Because it's going to be in and out very quickly. Um, doing partnerships on buy and hold, it's a little bit more of a challenge, okay? Because they said that like, you're marrying somebody, right? So you better know who you're doing a partnership on a buy and hold because it's a long-term relationship, okay? And then you might end up having different uh, objectives um, down the line. Okay, so be very careful who you partner up with if you're going to do buy and holds. But my recommendation is to do partnerships on fix and flips and do a joint venture agreement. Okay, what that means is a very, it's a one page, two page contract that stipulates uh, what each of the members' responsibilities and benefits are. Very, very simple that gets recorded. Uh, so that everything is legal. So you do not need to create an LLC just to do a flip because again, that's adding overhead. Um, okay, in a joint venture agreement, you're going to stipulate who the title of the property goes to and what the contributions are and how you split the proceeds of the flip. So very simple. Again, you're going to fix and flip, do a joint venture agreement. We can give you that agreement. 
Uh, and in fact, we have in Chicago, we will not share this in just a second, um, on the contracts, we have joint venture agreements. Um, so again, driven by equity. Don't create an entity per property, just to keep it very simple. And these are your three benefits, the asset protection, funding purposes, and tax depreciation. Now, when it comes to funding, if you, let's say, don't have an entity and you want to get into real estate, guess what? You're going to be limited to only 10 properties because you're not going to get more mortgages other than 10 under your personal name. So residential loans, no more than 10. However, if you're going to build a rental empire, you need to go the commercial route. And commercial route means that the banks are going to lend under your entity. So that's how you can grow exponentially. Um, you're going to have more funding sources. And obviously, the third biggest benefit is tax depreciation to minimize your taxable income um, from write-offs. Are there any questions on the line? So what I'd like to do is just a couple more comments and then leave the meeting. Um, when you do an S C Corp, that you run the company as a corporation, because if you do the IRS would what's called piercing the corporate veil. And what that means is you need to if you're you need to have uh, an a board of directors and elections uh, and typically one, but you still have to work. Uh, you have to have a rather meeting which basically says everything we in the past year is us. Um, they have these documents in your file because if the IRS will come in and say, yeah, you created a corporate, but you didn't run it like one because you didn't have the annual meeting, the election of the board of directors, the election of the ratification, things like that. So you want to make sure those things um, and have them in. Not to send them in anybody, but you have to have them in question. As far as uh, tax depreciation goes, what I was talking about, our clients, they make sure that the money in the tenant equals the money going to cover mortgage, real estate taxes, things like that, so that they're not dipping into their pocket to main property. But where the benefit comes in, like Hugo said, is in the depreciation, okay? If it's a if it's residential property, uh, it is written uh, over 27 and a half years. Um, if it's commercial, then that's nine years. Um, this thing called the uh, act allocation, if, if it's worth it to you, you can break down the component of the property, like the machine, the equipment, the furniture, faster than a building itself. So I have some of that. As well, it's, I'm sorry, box segregation where they separate out all the components of the purchase price because some some items depreciate faster than others, which goes along with what Google said, an even big tax uh, right off in the beginning. So that's um, my number. My, Google's got my contact information. I gave you my email. Um, be back in the office um, and I have a meeting so if you have any questions give me a call but Hugo thank you much for letting me uh, meet with your students thank you very much uh, Patrick uh, I'll share your contact information with the group and I appreciate your time no problem right. take care Patrick Okay, Rob, so there's a question. Uh, can you amend taxes? Uh, so we're going to shoot this question over to Patrick and create an entity in the past. So example, go two years back. Uh, so that's a question for Patrick. Okay, so we're going to get an answer for you. And then the next one is, let me scroll up, uh, that you're having... Um, so troubles getting funding for a property under your name. So banks can easily give you a loan under your entity, but you're absolutely right. 
they need you to be the personal guarantor on the loan. Okay, so that's very critical. You will always be the personal guarantor on the loan, even though the um, loan is given to your entity. So how does that affect you? For instance, if you're given a loan under your entity and you default, they're gonna be able to foreclose very fast, maybe six, seven months. And when the bank sells a property, maybe through the auction, if there's a difference, if there's a loss, then they're gonna come after you as the personal guarantor, okay? That's when your uh, personal guarantee kicks in. Um, now, there's another question. When creating a series LLCs, do you have to pay separate fees? Yes, you do have to create, uh, pay separate fees, but now um, the fees for series LLCs and regular LLCs are about the same. Um, so I would use just a regular LLC. I mean, what it boils down to is to split and separate all expenses for a single LLC. Something that has worked for us really well is to have a separate checking account per property, okay? Not per LLC, per property. So when it comes time to taxes, it's just super, super simple, okay? Are there any other questions on the line? Are there any other questions on the line? Okay, yes. Yeah, but I'll save your money for tax season. You only file one tax return and many tax returns. Okay, so let me share Patrick's contact information. It seems like my computer froze. Let me. Yeah. Well, I need to restart my computer. What are the expenses that you can deduct? Great question. So let me restart my computer in the meantime. It's totally frozen, and probably that is why you guys don't see the. You still hear me? Yes, very good. Perfect. Thank you, Luz. Okay, well, my computer restarts. Uh, somebody was saying, uh, what are the expenses that you can deduct? Okay, so when you buy a property, you rehab it, whether you flip it or buy or do buy and hold, you can deduct pretty much all your rehab. You can deduct the interest on the mortgage. You can deduct the points that you pay at closing. You can deduct um, the taxes that, that, that you pay, property taxes. Um, insurance, it's also another item that you can deduct. Um, you can deduct anything that you buy that is business related, okay? So it's huge. Savings are, are huge. So when you keep track of all your expenses, you'll be surprised how much you are going to be saving when it comes to paying taxes, okay? And you know, that's one of the big differences between um, the very wealthy and ordinary investors. So they're really wealthy leverage from taxes. So what it means is that if they make $100,000, they're gonna get to keep most of it. Whereas ordinary investors, you know, they overpay when it comes to taxes. So you have to leverage from taxes. What we mean is to get into good debt, okay? Uh, mortgages, so getting tenants to pay for your property, and on top of that, you get to deduct uh, all the rehab, interest on the mortgage. So again, buying rental properties is when you're gonna maximize your depreciation tax benefit, okay? Uh, are there any other questions on the line? Yeah. I want to learn all of that. 
how to leverage all of these deductions. Okay, uh, let me see. Do I need a license for my ALC when I created? I was told I needed to get a state or a state license. I thought it, um, so you don't need a license to create an entity? Absolutely not. Um, so you're gonna need a license if you want to become, let's say, a GC. But to create an entity, you don't need a license. Um, now, something that is really important is to not try to spend your time when it's not gonna make you any money. And one of them is trying to do your taxes, okay? You've got to leverage from the best people. So get to use people that all they do all day long is taxes, okay? Because if you, if you wanna learn the tax law, good luck. There are hundreds of tax books. Not only that, tax law changes frequently. So please, if you wanna make money in real estate, spend time finding great deals that do not need a big rehab. So you're gonna be making money in real estate when you talk to sellers, talk to listing agents and make offers. You're gonna make zero money when you spend time trying to learn tax law. So delegate to the pros and have them position you for growth when it comes to tax returns, okay? Because again, um, you need to show income, right? Because that's gonna affect your debt to income, your purchasing power. So when it comes to doing taxes, uh, it's okay to do write-offs where you have to and are eligible to write off, okay? But you also need to show income because that's going to position you and you're gonna look good in the eyes of the banks, okay? So, that's something to keep in mind. I want to learn all of that, how to leverage. So I'm gonna share uh, Patrick's content information. I'm not also gonna share the joint venture agreement, okay? So I'm gonna log on to Chicago Deal Vault and share that information. Let me share my screen with you. Okay. So if you go to uh, contracts and documents, there's a section for partnership agreements right here. So we have a joint venture agreement. This is gonna stipulate contribu contributions and um, returns, okay? And please, do a joint venture when you're gonna do a fix and flip. Uh, think twice if you're gonna do a joint venture or create an entity when doing buy and holds because that's a long-term relationship. Now to get in touch with Patrick or uh, we have a couple of accountants, uh, go on their preferred partners, categories, accountants. Okay, right here. So you're gonna have um, right here, Patrick Newman, Andrew Thomas. Okay, they're really, really good at what they do. And uh, they can also help you set up your entity. You can set up an entity in as little as a week, and it's going to cost you about five to six hundred dollars. Okay, if you pay the expedite fee, which is going to be about one hundred and twenty-five, you can get uh, incorporated in as little as four to five days. Okay, and um, they can give you either Patrick, Andrew, or us. We can give you a template for the bylaws that you need to have in place when creating an LLC. 